Hi everyone and welcome here to the second video on downstream processing in Bioreact. And today, rather than giving a broad overview, I'm going to give a very specific example where I'm talking about monoclonal antibodies. And why monoclonal antibodies? Well, there's already been over 500 of them that are used for treatment of diseases. And as you might know, in your body, we produce antibodies as soon as a foreign invader enters our body. So you could also imagine, and I also use some of them, not always monoclonal, but sometimes polyclonal, they can have various applications in sensing. So antibodies are also used in sensing. But in particular, you can see there's a huge drive in the market to find more and more monoclonal antibodies. And you can also see there is definitely a, a scale up happening monoclonal antibodies used for autoimmune diseases. So a very important aspect in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, one of the things before we talk about the general process is talking about the stability because that's very important here. So some products are more stable than, uh, than others and definitely for antibodies we need to look at the stability during the harvesting process and during the general processing. Things that we might want to consider is the pH they can tolerate, and this becomes important when we look at chromatographic techniques, which I'll come back to later, the temperature, but also freeze for stability in case you're going to use that. Some of these cells, as you might remember, particularly when we're working with Cho cells, they can be quite sensitive to shear stress. So you need to consider that when you use, for instance, certain filtration techniques. And there's also the colloidal and conformational stability in case you're exchanging buffers, which you will often do. So you need to consider that as well. Now, it's not just the stability, uh, but there might be some modifications happening. And usually, rather than just having uh, an empirical process to determine this, we would use some computational modeling, so some in silico tools to kind of predict what would happen to these products in order to speed up the process. So certain processes are not um, that applicable if you have antibodies that are not very stable. So I'll talk you through some of the things that you need to consider in this process. There are some general trends. We will have seen that uh, we, there's a, a definitely a trend going from bioreactors in batch or fat batch modes towards continuous reactor, mainly because it's much more cost effective. Now, the same applies to the processing step. So again, here there's a shift towards continuous or semi-continuous downstream processing. Another shift that we have seen happening is mainly because of uh, the pandemic. There's definitely a shift towards smaller production using single-use technology, such as, for instance, these biowave reactors. So that means they are more flexible towards market demand but you also have to consider that you might be generating more plastic waste. So that's another thing to consider. So generally we see this trend of smaller reactors, which is continuing. I have done a video of introduction to quality by design, so feel free to check that out in case you're not quite sure what it is. But we will see that process analytical technology, so PAT, and QBD are becoming, even though they have been recommended by, by uh, the FDA, becoming more and more important. And process analytical technologies is all about the sensors that you use throughout the process. There can be a sensor that you monitor like offline, so you have to take it to a specialist uh, lab. But here you particularly see that inline, so directly, either within the reactor uh, itself or that you have a step in between uh, where you take a little bit out of the reactor and then you monitor within seconds certain things. So inline flow monitoring of proteins using IR and RAMAM is definitely very important to consider when we look uh, at monoclonal antibodies. There's lots of very specialist techniques that you can use. Um, so you can make it as complicated as possible. So normally within quality by design, you have a very specific framework where you kind of assess what the critical quality attributes are. And within sensors, uh, actually there's a trend to move towards simpler systems. So also using sensors that are very typical, very low costs, such as pH and conductivity to estimate whether certain things are happening. 
So pH can be an indication of stability and conductivity is related to how your product is flowing through the stream. So you will see these sensors, even though they're very simple and everyone would use them in the lab, they're actually very important here. Now let's then have a look at the general downstream uh, process. Of course, there's not one specific format, so I'm just going to talk about generally what people would do. So we start the upstream process is where you actually produce uh, your antibodies, but these monoclonal antibodies will be in a mixture of other things. Now, you would need to harvest that, and then usually this involves either centrifugation or filtration, and that's what we call the clarification step. So in that step, we're removing cells and the cell debris. Now, and this is very different from uh, lots of other downstream processes, which is why I wanted to give monoclonal antibodies as an example, and I'll come back to this in the next slide. Here, also uh, very common is to use protein A affinity chromatography. And what this protein A does, it interacts with a very specific part of your antibody. So it can make sure that it really binds the antibody very well and removes some other compounds from it. Now, this, this affinity chromatography is normally coupled with a low pH hold for viral in, uh, inactivation. And it also means that you can elute off your antibody from your column. What follows then is some polishing steps, which usually include includes multiple chromatography steps and a filtration step for viral clearance. What you then do is you would exchange your product in the final formulation buffer to get the final product. Now let's talk a little bit about this protein A affinity chromatography and where it's used for. Now in this image here, you can see to which part of the antibody protein A binds. And there's a couple of other proteins that are important that can bind <coughs> to other parts of the antibodies and they can also be used uh, for chromatography. Now, the main advantage of this technology is that it has very high selectivity, very high purity, and it's very fast. So it would, if you wouldn't use it, you would definitely have to do more steps in order to get the antibodies from the mixtures. And things that it does is removes host cell proteins, host DNA, and impurities that are associated with your process. Now, there are also some very obvious disadvantages to this. Um, later on, you will see a distribution of the costs and you will see the resin really has a very high cost and generally attributes at least 50% of your cost for the DSP. After this affinity chromatography, you usually have a low uh, pH hold in order to elute off your antibodies. Now, even though most antibodies for a very short period of time can withstand these conditions, not all of them can. So it means that this process might not be very suitable for specific antibodies. It can also lead to some leaching problems uh, that other things come off. Uh, and for all of this, there is a drive to find alternatives towards this technique. But I would say the main drive is the cost. So people are looking at, for instance, membrane filtration, crystallization steps. But what's particularly gaining uh, more traction is using multimodal chromatography, so different chromatography steps in order to achieve the same. And these chromatography uh, steps would often have, uh, well, they would need to have a lower cost of the resin to circumvent the cost associated with this particular technique. Now, if we've gone through this whole process, so imagine that we have gone through all these steps and you would have obtained your final product, a key thing is how would you achieve quality control? Now, we will have seen in this QBD approach uh, that you would have to determine your uh, critical quality attributes and monitoring, it is an inbuilt quality control. So monitoring will take place throughout the process, not just at the end. But even at the end, there is a certain number of steps that you will need to consider. For instance, you will need to uh, do viral clearance studies, which is why these filtration um, steps at the end are applicable. And there are certain standards for that, which you can have a look at. Now, other things in terms of characterization include a standard physicochemical analysis, biological activity, the purity, obviously, and looking at impurities, contaminants, and the stability over time. Particularly here for these antibodies, we will look at the protein content, which you can very easily do with UV bis absorbance, and the potency would need to be recorded in order to make sure that it hits the threshold that you need. 
Now, even though we talk about monoclonal antibodies, which should be exactly the same, um, it is known that throughout the process, so different buffers or so differences in uh, your production process can lead to having different sugars expressed. Uh, and these differences in glycosylation patterns, that's certainly something that you will need to consider throughout. And that's the main source of having heterogeneity in your product. So you would carefully need to consider that. And this kind of comes back to the stability of your product throughout the process. So certain chromatography steps might be too harsh or your antibody can't handle this. And then you could see that these changes might occur. So making sure that your batch is absolutely reproducible and that you use exactly the same conditions is very important here. And the final thing which is really important to consider is how do we produce these antibodies? I have done a previous videos and where I've showed how we can use non-animal technologies to produce antibody mimics. Despite that we have recombinant technologies available and they should be widespread used, uh, we know that in the EU alone still a million animals per year are used uh, for production of antibodies, whether that's for diagnostics or for treatment. And the EU has now issued that if there's non-animal technologies available, then you should adhere to this. So this is where this concept of three R's comes into play, which is related to refinement, reduction and replacement of animals in research. So it is very important to consider non-animal technologies uh, for this process. But if you are working with animal immunization, there are a lot more guidelines that you have to adhere to. And then a final summary here. So as I mentioned, these monoclonal antibodies are becoming increasingly more important in therapeutics. So there's definitely a drive in the pharmaceutical industry to have a look at this. Now, in general, this downstream process includes specifically for monoclonal antibodies this clarification, uh, where we remove the cells in the cell debris, protein A affinity chromatography uh, in order to get the antibodies, even though I've said um, that uh, there are alternatives being researched due to the high cost of this, and then some chromatography steps, which can in involve, for instance, looking at a cation or an anion exchange, because a lot of these purities would have a different charge. Uh, and finally, filtration, uh, which is needed for viral clearance. Now, in this short diagram, you can have a look and, uh, at the expenses that we're dealing with. And you can see that at the moment, the main costs do come for this protein A affinity chromophore due to the cost of the resin. So that's why there is a drive uh, to look for alternatives. What I also want you to consider, and as I mentioned before, we've done videos on quality by design and process analytical technologies. Uh, the sensors are very, very much needed to monitor the product during the downstream process, and obviously also why the upstream process, while you produce it in the reactor, but also finally afterwards when you look at the quality control. So thanks for watching this video, and do keep an eye out on further videos that will appear in this playlist where I'll talk about the downstream processing in bioreactors.